Welcome back, my fellow gentle and modern primates. I am so glad to have you here with me today as we tackle the first of the seven myths presented to us by Genesis Apologetics, the scourge mid-tier creationist organization out to purge education and science from the masses. But before we get started, I thought we'd start with something of an interesting intro as we uh, take a peek into some, some interesting actual anthropology, uh, considering today we are covering kind of anthropology. It's it's more history and, and sort of cultural anthropology, but I still thought that this would kind of be a fun way to start things off as we inoculate our minds against what it is we're about to see. And today I kind of handpicked uh, this article by the Dodo, which I think is, is quite cute. Nine touching epitaphs ancient Greeks and the Romans wrote for their deceased dogs. Now I've actually first found out about sort of uh, canid epitaphs, like this this sort of writing of a, uh, a love letter to a, to a deceased friend or family member um, in the Egyptians when I took Egyptology as, as an undergraduate. It was mandatory for my minor, and um, the Egyptians did this as well, and they had the cutest names for their dogs. You know, they're, they're obviously in Egyptian, but when they translate, it's the same things that we name our dogs today, like the black one, or spotty, or the brown one, or he, he who chases bulls, or, or whatever. Very, very cute um, to, to sort of share our love of canids through space and time with other humans. So I'm going to read a couple of these cute epitaphs to you just because I thought it would be fun. Now look at this cute mosaic. Oh, what a good dog. Sweet babies. One of the, the first one is, I am in tears while carrying you to your last resting place as much as I rejoiced when bringing you home in my own hands 15 years ago. That is tragic, and it actually hurts my heart to think of this poor, ancient human being having to bury their canine companion. Thou who passest on this path, if thy haply, if haply thou dost mark this monument, laugh not, I pray thee, though this is a dog's grave. Tears fell for me, and dust was heaped upon me by a master's hand. This was a bad idea. This, this is some sad stuff, honestly. Oh, look at the pup in that one. Oh my god. And that's sad, though, that he's got his little docked tail. It made sense back then, right? Because you didn't want your, your canine companion getting its tail bitten off by a boar. Those guys can be pretty nasty, but still quite sad. Oh, Mia never barked without reason, and now he is silent. That's number six. That one is so sad. To Helena, foster child, soul without comparison and deserving of peace. Oh, she was a good girl. So sad. I think this just serves... Oh, I think this is in Pompeii. I think I've, I might have actually seen this one here. Maybe. Hold on. Let's check really fast. I know this isn't the content you guys are here for, but this is actually the content, content that I enjoy uh, the most, talking about the legit science. No, no, it's not the one. And I don't mean this one. This is the one I was... Wait. Wait. Well, it might be the one. I'm actually not sure. See, so this, this looks like it's the same thing. I mean, this is the same thing. It just lacks the writing. And I'm, I'm not well-versed enough to know. Perhaps this was a standard beware of dog sign. Um, and that's why some have writing and some don't. Oh, this one is cute. Oh, no, no, wait, hold on. So this, is, this one is from Pompeii. It says beware of dog. This one here, that's the one I just clicked on. Damn it, what am I doing here? This is, see, this is, you know, these, these scriptless ones are fun because it's like, obviously, you know, I don't have to do as much work and I can kind of just ad lib. Um, but the bad news is it's not scripted. So I end up sounding like a little bit more of an idiot than I can normally pass off when I've actually sort of have my, my uh, facts outlined ahead of time, if you will. Okay, so the, the, the one I was thinking of is Roman, you can see here, ancient Rome. This is the one I've actually seen in Pompeii. Mm, so sad. Isis more pert than Lesbia's sparrow love, purer than a kisses of a turtle dove, more sweet than a hundred maidens ruled in one, rarer than wealthy India's precious stone. She is the pet of Polbius. 
Issa, dear, she whines a human voice you seem to hear. Oh, what a good dog. Well, now that we're nice and sad, um, and we have appreciated the fact that the, the canid human bond indeed stretches back thousands of years, and if you've watched my canid domestication video, um, it actually goes back potentially 34,000 years, or even 40,000, depending on who you talk to. So today, now back to reality, or fantasy, <laughs> if we're making digs, we're covering the first of the seven myths. Now I'm gonna let I'm gonna let our boys here go, our narrator here, go ahead and tell us about this this first myth, and and then we'll just kind of dig into it. And I've got my tea right here. It's got my little feline fine on it. I got my my chocolate. Yeah, uh, dull the pain. Push it deep. Push it deep into the core of the planet, the magma core of the of um of our Earth, uh, so that it does not hurt me, um, with its stupidity. So let's start. Myth number one is, while the Bible may be inspired by God, it's not inerrant and parts of it are just myth. Some professors may also challenge the historical validity or reliability of the Bible. Inerrancy refers to God's original word having no heirs. Okay. Why is inerrancy important? Well, the question of ultimate authority is of the highest importance to the Christian. Now, pause. Inerrancy, if I remember correctly, and I know I have the power to look it up, but you, I think I would have to peruse through a couple of different definitions, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if inerrancy is, is indeed what I'm thinking of and is sort of in the same line as like infallibility, what we're dealing with is that the message itself is pure. Um, that what, what the point, what the Bible is correct in what it affirms, right? Not in literally what it's saying. Otherwise, there would be no room for a metaphor at all. And then you have to throw all the poetic books out. So I'm not sure um, that we're off to a strong start here with Jell and Genesis apologetics. Um, I do like this Moses character. If you, if you back it up at all, you can see he actually has um, very healthy looking nails for, for, uh, for a primate of his age. Um, but anyway, so I can already tell that we're, we're going into the whole, if, if you can't trust the literal interpretation, then why trust any of it? Um, I know several Christians who would, who would take great offense to that, um, many with uh, numerous more degrees than all the heads put together at Genesis Apologetics. It's not just a theological argument. You see, we can't offer the world a reliable gospel if it comes from an unreliable scripture. How can we offer the truth on any issue if we're suspicious of errors everywhere? Airline pilots will ground their planes even with the most minor of faults, knowing that one fault can destroy confidence in the whole machine. I think there's a little bit <laughs> I think there's a little bit more wiggle room with with a, a historical text, um, or at least partially historical text. Um, than, than with a, a giant metal bird that is indeed carrying um, dozens upon dozens of passengers, and if something goes wrong, it falls out of the sky and kills everybody. Whereas when we're dealing with um, with the text that is indeed quite old, uh, you, you have to look, you have to transfer through both uh, the language and the culture, and there are a lot of kind of room to, there's a lot of room to err there, which is why we consult extra biblical sources when we, I say that as if I'm an academic scholar in that field, it's why scholars do consult extra biblical sources so that they can kind of get a grasp on what it is we're looking at um, in, in sort of a, sh a sheer accuracy um, kind of standpoint versus what we're looking at with like a um, partial accuracy, so like uh, being hyperbolic or pure fiction. And by fiction, that, that doesn't, there's, there's no, no one is saying that there isn't sort of a, a benefit to fiction. We, God, some of the, some of the fictional titles we love and enjoy today are, are more meaningful than um, a lot of a lot of the history that individuals read just because it's so personal to them. Um, anyways. If you pick your car up after being serviced and find out they missed something. I like this. I like this diversity that, that Genesis Apologetics is doing here. Um, they're, they're really winning themselves points with with me, someone who is never going to actually buy what they're selling. But I do I do like this. This is this is nice. So we've we've got um two individuals here. Uh, who are not sort of run of the will, the, the, the kind of the young white dude that they like to kind of push, um, at least in the stock footage realm, if that makes sense, which it probably doesn't. Think simple, wouldn't that call into question the rest of their work? The entire core message of the gospel, including sin, redemption, and forgiveness, is rooted in Genesis history. If these core events are not true, how can we trust the theology behind them? Did Jesus die for the sins of a mythical Adam who lived in a mythical garden? The Many people would say 
Yes, because he would be uh, representative or archetyp archetypal, some might say, if they were saying it correctly, which I'm not, um, of, of all of humanity. Bible itself claims to be much more than myth. It claims to be God's word delivered through human authors to all... Someone needs to work on this guy's cuticles here. If you look, they're, they're bloody. That's not healthy. Of course, I say that and I pick my own cuticles. Humankind. So. Passages like 2 Peter 1, 21 and 2 Timothy 3, 16 assure us that God himself authored the scriptures. Psalms 119, verse 89 also makes clear that God's word is fixed or settled in heaven. Jesus confirms this by saying not even a dot on a letter will pass away from God's word until heaven and earth pass away. He also... So that's kind of weird though, right? Because there have been many changes, both kind of aesthetic or grammatical or spelling-wise or translation-wise, but there have also been some, some sort of lesser-known conceptual changes, um, like sort of the, the erasure that we see of the ancient Hebrews' uh, monolatrous belief systems, which, for those of you who don't know, monolatry is kind of the idea that the ancient Hebrews were like, Yahweh is the best, um, but there may or may not be other gods present. They don't matter because Yahweh is the one who's important anyways, but they're not explicitly denying a la monotheism that, that they don't exist. Um, but this has been expunged from at least certain small parts of, of, of the text. Uh, I think it's only in like Genesis 6 and, and maybe in Job, I want to say, uh, with like the divine council stuff. Um, because obviously speaking of the sons of God would, would sort of imply that this divine council is with Yahweh at the head, and then, you know, a smaller pantheon of maybe lesser deities. Which, um, later monotheists know likey. They don't like the idea that there was ever, um, sort of an evolution of, of religious beliefs. But that's fine. You know, the, I, I'm not sure if Genesis Apologetics actually knows about this. I would think they do, because I know Liberty University, which gives creationist courses, has, uh, sort of published a paper, I say published a paper, it's in their own journal, um, but that, but that covers monolatry, so, eh, mm, mm. press X to doubt, gang. So prayed to the Father, saying, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Jesus also confirmed that Moses authorized the Torah, rather than it being a compilation of ancient Near East mythology. Hmm, I, I have a feeling that this is kind of like a, like a, a, a dunk, a slam dunk attempt, if you will, on sort of the uh, the documentary hypothesis and uh, sort of adjacent hypotheses that uh, argue that you know, the the Pentateuch had more than one author, which it almost certainly did. I, I really very much encourage anybody who doubts that there were multiple authors to Genesis to just look into the presence of like the doublets or like repeat refrains and repeat entire stories um, that we see in like Noah's Ark or like the names of certain uh, sort of um, what's the word, uh, patriarch figures, etc. This is this is not rocket science, okay? I find it very hard to believe that we've got one guy who writes the story one way, and he's like, yeah, take two and two of, of clean and unclean, and then he's like, no, wait, take, take seven of the birds here, but then maybe different back there. I'm not 100% memory-wise up to date, or not up to date, um, just crystal clear on that, but I know there's differences. I, I looked this up at one time, um, and I suggest you do too. Jesus referred to the Old Testament over 40 times, and every time he treated it as real history including creation, the flood. How does he know that? Sodom and Gomorrah, Jonah and the fish, and the account of Cain and Abel. To Jesus, the Bible was clearly inerrant, inspired, and historical. The New Testament writers were so convinced that the writings of the Old Testament were the actual words of God that they even claimed scripture says when the words quoted actually came directly from God. W what does any of that mean? If, if I've got a book on, if I've got a, this book here, my my studying primates book, my studying, if I've got my studying primates textbook, right, and I want to be like, uh, oh yeah, we're talking about sort of, sort of the, the further, how you identify what further reading is going to be best for your given species, then I'm going to be like, yeah, studying primates says that when we're looking into further reading, the first thing we should do is check, you know, the, the cited sources of papers that we've already read, because they're likely relevant. So when you say scripture says, that's literally just saying, Hey, this compilation of holy of, of holy books that we have, um, which we refer to as scripture, says X Y Z. So I don't I don't know what kind of authority that 
Genesis Apologexis kind of trying to push onto it, but I think it's a bit unfounded. I think that's just linguistic. Um, but that's just me. In Romans 9, Paul accepted that God delivered his word directly to Moses. Paul also treats Isaiah's words as God himself speaking. In but that's kind of weird though, right? Because, yeah, obviously Moses, even, even I believe by academic standards, wrote some of the Pentateuch. Or at least by some, some people would, would propose that he's written some of it. So that doesn't necessarily negate the documentary hypothesis. In Acts 4, both Peter and John affirmed the creation account in the fourth commandment written by God. The believers who heard Peter and John also acknowledged that David wrote Psalm 2 by the Holy Spirit. There are some classic historical tests we can use to evaluate the validity of the New Testament writings. First, we can determine whether what we have today matches what was written originally. Second, we can evaluate whether the recorded events describe true historical events. Let's see how the Bible holds up to each of these tests. One way to apply the first test... Pause. That's decent. That's a decent way of going about it, I think. Tentative good job, Genesis Apologetics. Um, I feel like I'm not going to be able to, to say that many times, so savor this, um, you guys. Savor this this good job for, for, for uh, the Genesis Apologetics team. Um, I'm stingy with these good jobs. ...is to look at the time gap between the original writing and the copies that still exist today. The closer the copy is to the original, the greater chances that it more accurately represents the original. Ancient manuscripts like the New Testament were written on fragile material such as papyrus. This required ancient writers to continually make new copies. When we evaluate the number of New Testament manuscripts... Shame that they couldn't, you know, chisel it into stone like, uh, like some of our, our, our based mythologists living in like Assyria and Babylon. ...we have compared to other famous works of antiquity, the Bible exceeds them all with 5,366 manuscripts. Adding the copies from other languages, such as Latin, Ethiopic, and Slavic, results in more than 25,000 manuscripts that predate the 15th century printing press. By comparison, the runner-up historical text, Homer's Iliad, has only 643. We can also see that the time span between the original and these copies is closer than any other work compared. I think, I think I would like to see a little bit more in depth the criteria that they're using to sort of define what a manuscript counts, what counts as a manuscript, and also sort of the time frames that we're giving for like the New Testament, right? Um, because I don't think anybody was pinning Homer's Iliad for nearly as long as people were pinning the New Testament for. So it's kind of, you've, you've almost got like this weird sampling range bias going on there where it's like, yeah, I mean, obviously the New Testament was sort of in vogue for quite a bit longer than, than Homer's Iliad was. So you should suspect that there would probably be more, more copies of it. Um, but I'm not an expert on these kinds of things. So I will defer to those who are. I do think, though, that, that when you would account for this, I would, I would buy that the New Testament would still have quite a few more copies. Uh, it was very popular, and it was the dominant religion. Christianity has been the dominant religion, particularly in Europe and in the West in general, for quite some time now. So I don't find this hard to believe even when you are accounting for it. I'm just saying it's probably good scholarship. There is more. Even if all the copies of the Bible from AD 350 to today were destroyed, the entire New Testament, except for only 11 verses, could be reconstructed using only quotations by the early church fathers in the first few hundred years after Christ. This is because the church fathers frequently quoted large sections of scripture in their letters to each other. Next, we can test to see if what was written down actually happened. The Gospels written by Matthew, Mark, and John were written with or by direct eyewitnesses of the events in Jesus' life. A quick, quick, quick sort of pause here again, as I've done numerous times, and I'm sure it's exhausting for, as, is as exhausting for you as it is for me, um, but I'm not really quite sure why we're focusing so much on the New Testament when really most, most Christians and indeed most sort of uh, non-believers are going to be griping with the interpretations, translations, and sort of cultural implications of the Old Testament. You know, the one that has the most to do with creationism, Genesis apologetics, creationism, why are we spending all this time on the New Testament? I I'm not sure. 
but let's let them continue. Perhaps they will uh, illuminate the issue for us. I doubt it, but they might. Luke, a physician, wrote the account of Jesus' life for Theophilus, a high-ranking official. Luke said, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke continues to state that he carefully vetted his account of Jesus' life and ministry. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Do you guys think that maybe it's like not weird that a guy who 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 was quite close to Jesus was down with like kind of recording his life? Um, I don't find it particularly strange. I do find it a bit strange that some of the Gospels disagree on things. Um, but I'm also not a theologian and I haven't, I don't know all of the, uh, sort of, uh, refutes to those, to those gripes, if you, if you get my drift. Um, because when I read Debunking the Seven Myths about the Bible, Genesis, and Noah's Flood, I think that it's probably going to be about mostly Genesis and Noah's Flood. But <laughs> I feel, I feel as though I have been properly duped and I will reap the consequences of that duping. Other New Testament writers had similar testimonies. 1 John 1, 3 states, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. 2 Peter 1, 16 says, For we do not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We should also consider that 11 of the 12 disciples died terrible deaths, being killed for their unchanging testimony of who Christ was and of his resurrection. So I think generally when people consider, right, the resurrection and whether or not it happened, um, you, you generally hear like the, the, the argument that I at least have heard a lot is like, all right, well, the apostles were either um, liars, uh, they were mistaken, or it happened, right? Those are sort of the three deals. It could be any of those three as far as I'm concerned, and the fact that the disciples are writing the things that they're writing matches with all three of those things like luke being like yeah we were witnesses to the incredible majesty yeah well if he's lying he would write that right if he uh has been sort of duped or mistaken you'd probably still write that um and if it really happened you would write that now of course what what people say next is typically like well if the apostles died terrible deaths why would they do so for a lie um and maybe there's something to that i i personally think that lying is probably you know, I, I would stick to probably saying being mistaken is kind of our more Occam's razor, more most parsimonious answer. Um, I'm not married to it. I would be willing, I'm always willing to see anything, any new evidence someone brings to light. But, you know, I, I, I'm just making a point that typically the, the support that people give, the alternative explanations kind of jive with, with the New Testament claims that this did happen. No one's doubting that the disciples are claiming that this happened. Um, no one I know anyways. They were so sure that Christ was who he claimed to be, that they signed their testimonies with their own blood. Who would die for a resurrection? Off metal, by the way. Shining it reminds me of that episode of The Simpsons where Sideshow Bob, right? This was my cheese knife from the other day, but... I realize it kind of seems dicey that I, like, had it right here. But in this episode of The Simpsons, Side Joe Bob is, like, in jail, and he's writing a, a ransom letter or threatening letter, and he, like, t pokes the tip of his finger, and he's writing it in his own blood like it's a, like it's an ink pen, and he, like, licks the tip and writes it. It's it's very good. I'm not, I don't remember the season. I want to say five. That never happened. Paul said that without the resurrection, we are of all men the most pitiable, if indeed they suffered persecution for falsehood. It's also incredible that numerous Bible prophecies have come true over the years. Even prophecies that we now can confirm were written before the actual events occurred. This is the relevant topic of the discussion, is it not? This fits firmly into the debunking sodness about the Bible, right? Not Genesis or, or Noah's Flood, which are the juicy bits, the parts that I'm just salivating to get to. But I think that we can have a, a, a bit of a discussion about these. For example, Isaiah 53 specifically foretold Christ's trial, crucifixion, and burial. Isaiah 53 describes a Messiah, a Savior, who would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But didn't, didn't Jesus have like thousands of followers? 
So I wouldn't necessarily account that as being despised by men. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe that's, uh, that's on me. A man who would be despised and not esteemed by... Again, he was esteemed by his followers. ...others, one who would bear the griefs and carry the sorrows of humanity. I don't see of humanity there, do you guys? That was sneaky. That's quite sneaky to add that in when Isaiah 53, 4 says, bear the griefs and carry the sorrows. There's no humanity right there. Genesis apologetics. Shame on you. These descriptions could apply to many people throughout history, but it gets more specific as it continues by saying that people would consider him to be stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, and that he... Do I feel like that's not really as applicable as they're making it out to be either. We would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the punishment for our peace would be set upon him. Then it says, by his stripes we would be healed, and that the Lord would lay upon him the iniquity or sins of us all. The I, I, I just don't, I don't know about this, you guys. Let's, let's, please, please, don't. Don't look at how I'm spelling Isaiah. Um, I don't know how to spell. Here I am. I'm in my master's program. I can't spell. All right, let's 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 take a little peek at this for ourselves. Okay, who has believed our message and whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, um, I think this is relevant for the crucifixion, but not so much for the life of Jesus. Um, unless someone wants to correct me. Again, not a theologian. I w I've been duped into thinking this is primarily an evolution kind of series. <laughs> but I do not turn away from a challenge. Uh, we can look at this logically and still try to wiggle our way through it. Like one was from, like one from whom people had their faces, he was despised, we held him in low esteem. We, I suppose your average Genesis apologetic individual uh, would assume that we is in reference to Jewish people and that Jewish people held him in low esteem. Um, but I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not so certain. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering, we considered him punished by God. Um, I don't know about this part. Stricken by him and afflicted. Uh, again, not sure. Pierced by our transgressions. Yeah, I mean, that happened on the cross, but crushed by our iniquities. Not sure, not sure there was any crushing going on. I mean, if, if Genesis Apologetics, I, I know I'm being nitpicky, but if Genesis Apologetics is going to make the argument that this is, like, wickedly precise, then it needs to be wickedly precise. You dig? Okay. Um, the punishment was brought, that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That's, that's all, that's all, like, on par. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um... Eh, that's a little vague, but but I could get on board with that. Oh, God, this is a long verse. Don't worry, we're not going to go through all of it. We might. <laughs> he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. I'm pretty sure in at least one of the Gospels, Jesus did speak during his trial. Um, so not necessarily that. Um, either. And then you're kind of dealing with, like, all right, why are some of the Gospels saying yes and some are saying no? My answer is that inerrancy is not, like, a literal thing, but... That's just me. Um, who of his generation protested? All of the disciples did. Cut off from the land of the living. Um, I guess that means, yeah, the d dying? Yeah, okay, yeah, dying. Assigned a grave with the wicked. Well, he was crucified with criminals, but I think he was just put into a rando grave. So I don't know that he was buried with them. Uh, with the rich in his death. Are criminals considered rich? Though he had done no violence, that part's true. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'm down to clown with that. Okay, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Yeah, guys, I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't have any offspring, right? He will see his offspring and prolong his days. I don't know about that, guys. And the, Lord, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Yeah, but he died. And then he, even if you're considering the resurrection, he ascended. Mm, I don't know, you guys. I don't know about this. I think this is a bit vague. And this is supposedly, like, the most precise one. Uh, Therefore, we'll give him a portion among the great, and divide the spoils with the strong, because he's poured out his life unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many. 
and made the intercession for the transgressor, transgressors. That's pretty on par, except wouldn't it be the sin of all? Um, I think that this is pretty in line with the, with the Hebrews typical idea of the Messiah, but Messiah does mean anointed one. Um, and at least from the very brief sort of deep dive, deep, brief, deep dive that I've looked into, most Jewish scholars at least don't think that Christ matches all of the Jewish sort of criteria. Um, but, but, I can't emphasize this enough, you guys. I'm not a theologian, and I didn't take on these videos to, to, to argue uh, theological semantics. Um, and yet here we are. <laughs> the passage continues to be incredibly specific about Jesus' death and crucifixion by stating that he would be oppressed and afflicted, yet like a lamb led to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers would be silent. He would not even open his mouth in defense. Well, what have you got to say for yourself now? Wait. Speak! Wait, you guys. Are we... Are we getting a, um... Movie clip to justify that statement? Not like scripture, um... Like it has been, but, but like, but like a movie clip that was kind of ripped. You guys think they got permission for this movie clip? Let's check. Ooh! Got the seven myths. And we got... Download of our free mo <laughs> We've got endless shilling, but we have no actual um, solid sources linked. So yes, they did just rip this video from from who from ever from whoever poor uh, chumps did indeed make it. Is this like an early passion of the Christ? This is a pre Gibson passion. be pissed if I get demonetized for showing the 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 uh, copyright infringement that Genesis Apologetics is getting down with here. What are you? Well, say something. Jesus, is like, yo, dude, you need a mint. Look at him. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, wait, wait, reset. There we go. Yeah. He's like, dude. Tic tac. Don't you want to defend yourself? Do you want to die? Don't you realize I have the power to release you or have you crucified? This is my face watching these videos. That's me. Do you want to die? Yes. Sorry, my gang. As usual, I had to go ahead and refill my tea um, because it's, this is um, hard to do without a nice drink. And since I'm taking a nice break from wine, um, out of solidarity for, for my, my colleague who just left for South Africa, um, and she was my, my, wine, my wine pal, uh, it's tea only. And that, that's all that's standing between me and the abyss. Um, that, that Genesis Apologetics pushes me to the very edge of every time we engage with one another. Um, but, but I do it for you guys, um, and I do it, I do it for science. And I do it because it's funny. This is becoming a let's watch, by the way. This is just watch me watch this film. Which I really feel, I really feel like this is a passion film. I really feel like it. The Passion of the Christ. Okay. Okay. We don't want the 2004. Oh, wow. Did it really do that bad on Rotten Tomatoes? Roger Ebert liked it, though. The thing about that film is that it's just, it's, I've seen it, and, and it's very, like, it really hurts me to watch it. Just because there's a lot of pain and suffering and 
really don't like that. Um, <laughs> Passion of the Christ sequel. <laughs> Passion of the Christ 2. Electric Boogaloo. Passion of the Christ 2. Too Christ, too furious. You thought the money changing tables was bad. Christ is back and he's ready for revenge. <laughs> Oh my god. Let's click on it. Oh! Resurrection. You think Gibson's gonna find a way to make this one, like, really rough to watch, too? The weird thing is... Hmm... Yeah, remember how Gibson's, like, a huge anti-Semite? I remember that. Well... Maybe, maybe there's an old version? Older version. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. That's the same version. Now, why do they gotta, why do they gotta put the close-up of, like, the, the freaking, um, Gilbert Godfrey Satan baby right here? You guys seeing? You, you'll see what I mean. In Passion of the Christ, scary baby. Look at this. This is Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> hey, Christ. <laughs> I'm Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> and I'm here. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's it. I know it seems like I have had wine, but I really haven't. Mm, I don't like this very much. I don't like this very much either. Well, the mystery continues. It even says that his grave would be made with the wicked and his death with the rich. Even the very purpose that Christ came was foretold by this chapter, stating that he would pour out his soul unto death so that he would bear the sin of many. Oh, you guys, I'm so sorry this section's so long. And rejected of men, man of sorrows, and acquainted. With grief. Oh my god, look how long the scene goes on to. And afflicted yet. Oh, sorry, guys, I'm skipping. Is there any other person throughout recorded history who fits these descriptions better than Jesus Christ? No, but if you ask some Jewish people, right, they would they would say no because the Messiah has not come for the first time yet. Um so 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 the point is is a bit moot, is it not? Um, but Genesis Apologetics doesn't care about that. They care about owning the Evotards. Not only does this chapter show how the Bible predicted Christ's life, crucifixion, and burial, it demonstrates just how reliably the Bible has been transmitted over the centuries. Consider this. There's the original book of Isaiah written in the 8th century before Christ. Next, there's the copy found in the Dead Sea Scroll Collection that dates about 125 years before Christ. Then we have the copies that are from about 1,000 years ago. And finally, today's version. Now that the Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered, we have proof that these incredibly specific prophecies were written before... Do we know? Do we know for sure that the oldest scroll was 700 BC? <sighs> Isaiah, again, please don't. Scroll. Mm-mm-mm. Is the oldest copy dating approximately 1,000 years older than the oldest Hebrew manuscripts. And history of discovery, the exact authors are unknown. Um, <laughs> interesting. Radiocarbon dating. <laughs> it's only, it, you know, it, not okay for thee, okay for me. Um, and between, okay. 356 to 103 BCE or 150 to 100 BCE, respectively. Now that's done by radiocarbon dating. So I'm sure, I'm I'm hoping you guys can first really really just just get your hands into the to the hypocrisy that's going on here in Genesis apologetics being okay with radiocarbon dating sometimes, but then all other radiometric dating outside of the ranges that they're okay with that that sort of reinforce this, this 6,000 year old um 
uh, sort of history, um, are, are po- they poo-poo on those ones. Those ones are, no, 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 we don't like them. Um, but also the fact that we're getting these two ranges, neither of which fits into 700 BC. Th- those are still extremely old, and in and of themselves, they're quite oppressive. But the problem is, this original Isaiah scroll is just like, it's like their light foot dating method. Like, they're like, yeah, we're, we're pretty sure that when we count like genealogies, that's what we get. Um, but, but they have no idea in actuality. Um, which is not great. You know, I mean, you can't say the oldest scroll was written in, written in 700 BC. You can say we think that it's written in 700 BC based off of uh, intra or like kind of yeah intrabiblical evidence, but you can't say that's how it is because you don't know that to be the case. Christ was even born, showing their divine inspiration. We can now also test how reliably the Bible has been transmitted over a 2,200 year period. The result, incredible. Famous theologian Dr. Norman Geisler writes, of the 166 words in Isaiah 53, there are only 17 letters in question. Ten of these letters are simply a matter of spelling, which does not affect the sense. Four more letters are minor stylistic changes, such as conjunctions. The remaining three letters comprise the word light, which is added in verse 11, and does not affect the meaning greatly. Thus, in one chapter of 166 words, there is only one word with just three letters in question after a thousand years of transmission, and this word does not significantly change the meaning of the passage. Wow. Over. T- so you're telling me that an important uh, spiritual text to, to a group of people that were a somewhat large religion at the time managed to keep the general themes, the general aspects of, of one of their one of their very sacred scrolls sort of consistent throughout the years as they continued to remain a large religion. Um, wow. Shocking. I, I am blown away. The truth is, it is quite interesting and, and it is a testament to human ingenuity, but the fact of the matter is this is completely leaving out the number of times that it's been translated. Um, and there aren't one-to-ones for every single Hebrew word. Anybody who, who can speak Hebrew can tell you that. Um, so there's, the, you know, p- people do their best. I'm not saying that there's anything nefarious going on, but I'm just saying, like, to, to say that they're direct translations doesn't really mean anything because Hebrew is just a different language. Um, and by different, I don't mean different, like, English and, and German are different. I mean different, like, they're they're fairly far removed from one another. Um, but but on top of that, there's there's just this entire aspect where it's like, Christians do this a lot, and, and I think you guys are going to understand what I mean once I get done saying it. They make the exception the rule. So it's like, because this particular text has, has fared quite well throughout its translations, or, or so they say, at least that the Hebrew version has fared quite well, um, that means all of them necessarily did. Um, even though the Bible is written, I think it's like 66 books, written by, you know, hundreds of different people throughout time. So I don't really think that you can that you can extrapolate to that point, if you know what I mean. I mean, you can say, yeah, yeah, there, there might be a good case for it. But these guys, the way they present it is that it's like it's done and over with. Um, and, and I just don't know that you can say that. Two millennia of copying this text, and over 99% of it matches an original written before Christ. And the incredibly specific prophecies it tells about Christ, all of them came true. It's no surprise that the field of archaeology continues to confirm the historical accuracy of the Bible. Check out this list of 53 people in the Bible confirmed by archaeology. Notice, though, that a lot of them are like, like from kingdoms that aren't Hebrew, obviously. I mean, you, you would you would hope, you would hope very deeply that in, in a book as large and, and spreading as much time as, as the Bible, that there would be historical accuracy in some of the characters involved, especially because it is, it is uh, by and large, at least the Old Testament, is intended to be a chronology um, and also kind of keeping of the rules. Um, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's like, yeah, the other Bible's entirely fiction. Um, Obviously, there are some. There are people who who've been proven to have existed. The problem comes with with grandiose events like like the Exodus, which hasn't been proven to exist. And there is no evidence that that Egypt could have even housed that many Israelites, let alone 
um, that there was a mass exodus of them. And we know this because they kept various records. I, I believe, don't quote me on this, it's been quite some time, but it's like like uh, food yields and how much food was used each year, right? Um, granary, or not granary, uh, census records, things like this. Um, attendance for festivals like the, that of the Apis Bowl. Um, I don't know how consistent each of those were, but I, I would feel fairly confident to say that, that that we know the general population size of Egypt during the time that the Exodus was said to occur. And that's why you won't find a scholar who says that there's evidence that it has. My, my Egyptology professor was a devout Catholic. And she, even she was like, yeah, we right now we don't have anything. It could happen. Maybe we'll find some evidence. But as of right now, there's not any. And you go on current evidence. That's good scholarship. These are some of the reasons why tens of thousands of ministry professionals have signed the Bible petition, affirming that the Bible alone and in its entirety is the infallible written word of God in the original text. And Mind you, these are like people who are already like who already are, are like Christian, right? Um, which is quite interesting. Um, there, I wonder if you accounted for for sort of like population size, right? If that how that would compare to like Project Steve, which is like the number of people just named Steve that accept the theory of evolution, which it's like I think it's like a, about five thousand people um, just named Steve, mind you. And is, therefore, inerrant in all that it affirms or denies on whatever topic it addresses. So this leaves us at a crossroads. Either this book is divinely inspired and true in all it says, including historical events. Oh, I didn't mean to pause, sorry. Or it's not. It can't be true and untrue at the same time. What gives us the right to pick and choose which parts we want to believe? People because we're humans and we live in a world that is dictated by, by laws of, of, of the general reality. Um, that we inhabit, physics, chemistry, biology, um, and these these things are are relatively consistent, right? These these laws don't just change over time, and when we apply these laws to to areas of of history, right, dating things or or sort of um, sussing out where and when things happened and if certain people existed, um, if they tell us that things like like a six thousand year old creation or a worldwide flood didn't happen. Um, and we have evidence that exists that it directly precludes it from happening. That's why we pick and choose to boot those things from the list. I think when you get to the second two, as I said earlier, you're, you're dealing with sort of a different animal. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not the person that you would talk to talk to about that. I would recommend um, some, some of the work by uh, Paul Agia or, or uh, Inspiring Philosophy, both who give very different takes, but both are, are very well researched unlike me on this particular subject. Now these guys, hold on, hold on, mm, hold on. These guys right here, the rest of these are gonna be lovely for us. Maybe not Moses didn't, I'll do some research on six so that I can at least come with some, with some, uh, some, some assistance with that, right? Um, but, but I'm hoping that we're gonna actually discuss some real evidence and not just go over like like scripture the entire time, but if we do, we'll still have a good time. People understand, if the Bible is not based in real history but claims to be historical, it's not authoritative. And if it's not authoritative, they won't follow and obey it. If it is not true, then there's no reason to submit to it. Since the Bible is true, it has authority over all matters of life. When Christians understand that the scripture is inerrant and historically valid, their faith and their minds are fused together, like two pieces of a puzzle. Got this vaporwave boy back. I do like that. That's 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 one of my favorite parts about these videos. This provides a solid foundation for their faith Isn't in the work of Christ, too? as revealed in the words of Christ, resulting in a solid foundation for their faith, a real faith that produces good fruit. So there we have it. One authorized compilation with 66 books spanning over two millennia with incredible reliability and accuracy. Governments ban it. Philosophers dismiss it. Scientists ridicule it. The media makes fun of it. Well, I hope that you guys did just see that Scientific American paper was titled 15 Creationist Nonsense Topics or whatever. Not biblical. These guys like to equate that the AIG does the same thing. They like to equate creationism with Christianity, right? And I know plenty of cool Christians who are not uh, subscribing to, to, this, to this nonsense, honestly. Um, and, and, and that's kind of 
the long and short of it. But most in our society simply ignore it. But the Bible is still the world's best-selling book, with over 4 billion copies sold over the last 50 years. Currently, the complete Bible is available in over 600 languages and rising. Nothing can equal its power to change lives, and an unbelieving world cannot... Someone want to explain to me why this kid's got a lantern? Why, 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 why is it 2020 and this kid has a lantern? Or whatever, September 17th, 2019, when, when this particular compilation was composed, and this boy's got a lantern? I wouldn't trust a child with a lantern. Um, especially next to all of that flammable um, paper. Not change it from being God's authoritative revelation to mankind. It is aesthetically pleasing, I'll say that. John F. MacArthur. Hmm. Time to look up this look up this guy. Look this guy up. John F. MacArthur. John F. MacArthur. Oh, you know he descends from like the Scottish clans. Alright. He's an American pastor, author known for his internationally syndicated Christian radio program. Grace to you. He's been the pastor teacher of Grace Community Church in the Sun Valley, California since February 9th, 1969. I think this is getting a little bit Irish, actually. Um, let's see, what, what do we got here? Theological views. Mm. You guys seeing this? You guys seeing this? I know you are. Young Earth Creationism advocates Young Earth Creation in his book, Battle for the Beginning. And his sermons. Speaking about evolutionary theory, he write that, writes that Christians ought to expose such lies for what they are and expose them vigorously. He argues that the battle for the beginning is ultimately a battle between two mutually exclusive faiths. Faith in scripture versus faith in anti-theistic hypotheses. It is not really a battle between science and the Bible. John, you're not a smart man. Um, you're a devout man, but you're not a smart man. I refuse to believe that anybody who has sat down and really given evolutionary theory a look, and when I say a look, I mean evaluating the tenets and how they apply to ecology and biology at large, um, I, I find it hard to believe that any adult with, with a set of functioning brain cells is, is going to push that to the wayside. Um, the only thing I think that tends to get in the way of accepting evolutionary theory, the two things that do actually, is, is ignorance, one, um, and, and delusion, two. And I really do think those are the two things. I've met very kind young earth creationists. I have a friend who's a young earth creationist, a former co-worker. And if you were to ever stumble upon these videos, I, I hope you're doing well. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that I, I would feel comfortable saying both of those things to, to any young earth creationist that I met. Um, you either don't understand it or, or you're actively attempting to push it from your mind uh, for one reason or another. It's just too simple of a concept um, to, to, to deny. Uh, this, this is why anybody who actually gets into biology, why the closer you get to the life science, the number of people who actually uh, uh, even dabble with younger creationism and indeed with intelligent design uh, shrinks exponentially. But let's hear what uh, MacArthur has to say. Why does he look so much like Mitch McConnell here? He's got that turtle thing going on. Um, and he doesn't even have a good tie. At least Kent has good ties. To a person who says that he is a Christian but denies the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, I would say several things. You, you are denying God's own claim for the Bible. You're, you're denying what God, the Holy Spirit, who authored Scripture, says about Scripture. That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you deny circular reasoning, you're a dummy. Go to the principal's office. That's what I'm hearing from, from John right now. If you don't believe the Bible when it says to believe the Bible, then, then you're, 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 you're a heretic. And if you use any kind of, of, of critical thinking to evaluate it, uh, you're also a heretic if you don't come to, to the conclusion that I came to. Um, so, so that huge group of Christians that, that are cool with, with evolution and the, indeed the age of the earth, um, y'all can just back yourselves right back up into heathen town and leave us, us, us pious and uh, zealous individuals to, 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 our, to ourselves. 
that every word is pure, that um, the, the scripture is God breathed. Not only that, not only those explicit statements are you denying, but you're denying every time in scripture it says, thus says the Lord. And yet, then you're denying the overall superintending power of God over his revelation. Now, what that does essentially is say this, you are the judge of scripture. You've just made yourself the authority over the Bible. So you're going to be the one we have to trust to tell us what's true and what's not true in the Bible. And here's the problem with that. That's what John is doing to us now. He's trying to tell us what's true and what's not true. I guarantee you, John, Macar John MacArthur, yeah, MacArthur, I guarantee you he's not going to be um, going around and telling us that, that the poetic books are meant to be taken literally um, or that, that portions of, of uh, Revelation are meant to be taken as literally. Like there's literally a, a seven-headed dragon that emerges. Um, but, but somehow he feels okay with telling everyone that, that his, he's the one that, that you need to go through to, to accurately interpret this. And, and you know, I, I can't even imagine how many Christians are insulted by this. Um, that the, the, this, this random hack can sit there, um, and now he's not even wearing a tie to distract from, from the, the very uh, uh, testudine look of him. And tes testudine does not mean testicles. Testudine meaning uh, turtles. Just making sure that I got that right. Um, it's, it's, it's insulting. It's appalling. It's ridiculous. Um, and it's irritating. Honestly, that's, that's what gets me the most is that, you know, guys like this have all, you know, have an inordinate amount of cash. And then you've got ecologists who are working out in the jungles of Thailand in order to, to, uh, work with villagers so that they can better handle their cobra problems. And I know this because I met these individuals when I was out there doing my undergraduate research, um, are, are making pennies. It's not right. It's just not right. Um, but let's listen to John MacArthur tell us more about uh, debunking the seven myths about the Bible, uh, Genesis and Noah's flood. If you deny inerrancy, the only reason you would ever deny inerrancy would be essentially to deny something in the Bible that you don't like. No. Something that does not mesh with the reality that we live in. That's why people reevaluated their interpretations that is so key here, you know, and, and, you know, you've, you've got these super intelligent believers out there, right? Like, like Francis Collins, I, everyone loves to bring him up, um, it, who, who's down with Christianity, right? He's, he's, he's Catholic, so I'm sure John MacArthur wouldn't consider him a real Christian, but, um, but, but the, the absolute, the absolute gall of him to sit here and, and, and tell every other individual who's put uh, time and effort into understanding what it is that the text says, that they're wrong uh, because his English version says uh, that, that, that a, talk, a literal talking snake uh, led, led to, the, to the fall of humanity based off of temptation. It irritates me. It really just, mm, it just gets my undies in a twist. I'll tell you that. And when you've done Ooh, that, close up. you've now said what the Bible says about that, it can't be true. It's not true. Once you have broken the link in the chain, how do we know that anything is true? So when <laughs> Slippery slope argument. If you do this, then if, you know, if, if A, then Z. That's what he's going with here. The Bible claims inspiration for all of it, and you break that, then where do you go? How do you trust any of it? For you could you could start, for example, say, well, I don't believe Genesis one and two. I don't believe in a six day creation. I believe in some kind of evolutionary process. That's not in Genesis one and two. So the question is, if that's not true, what else isn't true? And who's the person that's going to tell us what else isn't true? And apparently you, John MacArthur, apparently you're the one to let us know. Um, I don't like that. You know, I don't, I don't like the idea that one person gets to tell us how to interpret anything. That's why science is so cool. Because it allows any individual, via methodology section, to go out and repeat things on their own. 
of course, you have to have the resources, but it, this, this sort of uh, built-in peer review double check system is, is what allows for individuals to, to double check people. You know, and I know it's different because what we're dealing with here is, is much more open to interpretation. It's an ancient text, um, but, and it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Unlike Genesis Apologetics, I will admit when something isn't a one-to-one. Um, but I just really don't like it when, when people get up here and, and try to make their authority synonymous with the authority of, of, of a deity. You know, it, it really uh, it grinds my gears a little bit. What isn't true is hiding something that is true, and where do we go for that? You literally unravel the scripture if you deny its inerrancy. Looking for answers about what the Bible teaches about creation, the fossil record, dinosaurs? Download the Genesis Apologetics app from the iTunes or Google Play stores for answers to these questions and more. Okay, I'm going to assume that, that now we're about to delve into the next of the myths. Um, and I will leave that for, for another time because I'm frankly about to sneeze. No? No. I'm frankly exhausted. I find that very disheartening. Um, and, and, you know, being, being here in, in a different country where, where the, these kinds of attitudes are far less common than they are in the United States, for whatever reason, it, it's just, it doesn't bode well. You know, it doesn't bode well at all. These, these kinds of people who are, who are kind of authorizing this, this very authoritarian interpretation of a book that means so much to so many people, um, it feels very theocratical. Don't like it. Um, all right, let's double check that that's the end here. I think it is. Oh no, we've got the credits. Copyright license to use clips from Jesus of Nazareth miniseries. Okay. Myth number two. Okay, well, they didn't even give us a chance to... They didn't give us a chance to read the credits. What's the point of the credits if you... I guess they're assuming that you can kind of pause it. Um, I like this background here. What is that, like a... Like a gnome, a gnome house, an elf house. Elves are pretty big. Sometimes it depends on the mythology. A pixie house, maybe, perhaps. Anyways, you guys, I I think that's gonna do it for today. I think we've we've had just about enough. Um, I will I will send you off with with a picture of of a primate that I like very much, just like we did last time with the proboscis monkey, who who is indeed quite lovely. So today. What do we want to look at? Who, who who have I been really reading about and liking lately? Mm, 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 mm. Let's go with Diana monkeys. Look at them. Look at these Diana monkeys right here. Not That one's not as cute. <laughs> that one's kind of mad. But these are very, uh, very nice uh, old world monkeys. I know they don't seem like old world monkeys because of the tail, but you'll notice that the tail isn't actually prehensile. Um, I believe they're female philopatric, but I'm not positive. Um, but they, they've got like these, these very interesting markings. Um, I believe sometimes they can be uh, prey animals too. Typically what we see is like a large snakes and birds of prey. Um, but yeah, they're awesome. Look at them. Look at those guys just grooming each other. They're very handsome looking monkeys. Um, this one, this one, not so much. This looks like uh, the sleep paralysis demon that I see in, in the corner of my room um, some nights. Uh, but but I, do, I do like these ones. I like this baby right here. That's a cute one. And I like this one. This, one, this is considered an, an aggressive stance when we see um, monkeys. They tend to lunge towards you and raise their eyebrows up like that. It's, it's pretty common. Anyways, Diana monkeys are cool. Genesis Apologetics is not. And that's the take home for today. Um, so absolute best of luck to you guys out there. I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening or afternoon or asleep. Um, and I will see you next time.